Did a good job. I have to open up your Bible to Esther chapter 8. Esther chapter 8. read the whole chapter. On that day, King Ahasuerus gave Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews, and Mordecai came before the king for Esther and told how he was related to her. So the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther appointed Mordecai over the house of Haman. Now Esther spoke again to the king, fell down at his feet, and implored him with tears to counteract the evil of Haman the Agagite and the scheme which he had devised against the Jews. And the king held out the golden scepter toward Esther. So Esther arose and stood before the king and said, If it pleases the king, and if I have found favor in his sight, and the thing seems right to the king, and I am pleasing in his eyes, let it be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman, the son of Hamathada the Agagite, which he wrote to annihilate the Jews who were in all the king's provinces. For how can I endure to see the evil that will come to my people? Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my countrymen? Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther and Mordecai the Jew, Indeed, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and they have hanged him on the gallows because he tried to lay his hand on the Jews. You yourself write a decree concerning the Jews, as you please, in the king's name and sealed with the king's signet ring. For whatever is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's signet ring no one can revoke. So the king's scribes were called at that time in the third month, which is the month of Sivan, on the 23rd day. And it was written according to all that Mordecai commanded to the Jews, the satraps, the governors, and the princes of, of the provinces from India to Ethiopia, 127 provinces in all, to every province in its own script, to every people in its own language, and to the Jews in their own script and language. And he wrote in the name of King Ahasuerus, sealed it with the king's signet ring, and sent letters by couriers on horseback, riding on royal horses, bred from swift steeds. By these letters, the king permitted the Jews who were in every city to gather together and protect their lives, to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the forces of any people or province that would assault them both the little children and women, and to plunder their possessions. On one day in all of the provinces of King Ahasuerus, on the 13th day of the 12th month, as soon as I find the thing. Uh, on one day in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, a copy of the document was to be issued as a decree in every province and published for all people, so that the Jews would be ready on that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. The couriers who rode on royal horseback, on royal horses, went out, hastened and pressed on by the king's command. And the decree was issued in Sushan, the citadel. So Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel of blue and white, with a great crown of gold and a garment of fine linen and purple. And the city of Sushan rejoiced and was glad. The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. And in every province and city, wherever the king's command and decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness and a feast and a holiday. Then many of the people of the land became Jews because of their fear of the, Jew because fear of the Jews fell upon them. Nothing like you might going out in the middle of talking. <laughs> uh, in January 1st of 1863, that was when President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, declaring that all persons that were slaves in the Confederate States uh, were to be free. Uh, now, this didn't actually free the slaves. Uh, they were still at war, the North and the South, they were still at war together. So the pro proclamation just was a forefront. It set up the freedom of the slaves. They had to still continue fighting in the war. And the only way that that was going to be 
uh, issued as law as if the North were to win the war. So the war was fought from April 12th of 1861 to April 9th of 1865. So for four years, our country was at war uh, against our own brothers and sisters. Uh, that's, that's hard to believe that that kind of evil could happen among family like that. But we were at war with each other uh, for four years. Uh, so they had to wait. This this decree was issued, this proclamation was issued in 1863. So they had to wait two more years for the war to end, the North to win, before they were to be sleeved, uh, to be free. Uh, and one of the other things that the proclamation did was it allowed all the black uh, men that wanted to, they could join the army or the navy and they could help to fight against the South. So that allowed them to stand up for themselves and to fight. Now, uh, when you're talking about that kind of stuff, it takes a great deal of courage to overcome all of that. And when we're looking at the story of Esther, she displayed her bravery uh, before in previous chapters by going before the king. If she was to go before the king and he didn't want her to, she could have been killed. But she displayed her bravery and she went before the king. Then she displayed her courage by having the, the feast with the king and Haman and letting the king know that Haman was an evil man that was trying to kill him. So she stood strong there. And today we find her standing tall for her own people. She's standing tall so that they might live. Now let me ask you, what kind of courage have you displayed for God's glory and for the advancement of his kingdom? As a Christian, what kind of courage have you displayed for God's glory and for the advancement of his kingdom? 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. God will use his power to accomplish his will in our lives. He will help us. He will lead us out to do whatever God has called us to do. Now, when I look at the life of Esther, in all of my study, most of the experts, the theologians, most of them say that Esther was about 14 years old when she married King Ahasuerus. Now, that may sound strange in today's culture, a 14-year-old getting married, but it wasn't that long ago, and maybe many of you in here have experienced that, got married 16 years old. And, and maybe 100 years ago, they got married at 14 years old. So it sounds kind of odd in today's society, but... Uh, Esther became queen when she was 14 years old. Now, that was in the seventh year. Now we're in the twelfth year. So this is five years later, we find Esther to be 19 years old when she takes this stand. And all of the Jews and all the provinces of, of the king Ahasuerus depended on a 19-year-old girl to take a stand so that they could live. And, and I find that amazing that this young lady did all of that. Uh, and Esther stood all those times before alone in the presence of the king. When she went before the king to, to ask about the banquet, she was alone. When she sat down with the king and Haman, she was alone. Now today, she finds herself not standing alone. There's somebody that's standing with her, and that somebody's her cousin, the man that would become her father, Mordecai. And he is standing there with her right by her side when she... Uh, brings this up before the king. Uh, normally I read through the scriptures, but for the sake of time and the length of this text, I'm not going to go back, but uh, y'all understand what I've just read. So when we're uh, in the scripture, it said that the king said, no one could revoke a decree written by the king. So when he said that, he was talking about anything that he wrote. So he was also talking about the decree that he had issued under Haman. Not even the king had the power to go back and change that edict that was issued. So uh, that meant that the first decree that Haman issued, it was set in stone. It was going to happen like this. They could not change it. So what the king was telling Esther and Mordecai was, you figure out a way to fight against this. You, you come up with a way 
that you might be able to defend yourselves. So he left it in their hands and uh, they took care of it. Sometimes God will remove our problems. Sometimes we can ask God like a tumor uh, on a lung, a mass on a lung, and we can ask God and he'll remove it. Sometimes he allows the doctors to get those things for us and to help us to take care of us. And I, I, wish, I wish I had an answer for when God does nothing. But I don't. Sometimes God lets us leave this world. And he lets us come back home. And I don't understand why sometimes he lets somebody live and sometimes he lets them go on and, and go home. I wish I had an answer for that, but I don't. I'm not God. I don't understand his full master plan. I don't see all that he sees. But sometimes God will help us through these situations. He'll allow a doctor to help us. Or maybe he'll come up. He wants us to come up with a different solution for our problems. To help us to overcome them. Now, I'm sure that everybody in here at one time has prayed for patience. I know uh, I, I could definitely need some patience at times. I like to think that I'm a patient man. But I know that God... Is still working on me and still trying to teach me patience. Uh, sometimes we ask God for patience and he gives us situations in order to teach us patience. We've all had the health concerns. Sometimes God says yes, sometimes he says no. Uh, sometimes he gives us the doctors to help us out. But the thing is, we need to be dependent on God. We need to be fully dependent on God. But we also need to be independent. You see, God's working things out for us in our lives, and sometimes he's, he's like a parent who's trying to teach us important lessons. He'll allow us to go through some things, and, and uh, he'll try to teach us. Maybe like a, a parent is trying to teach a young child, maybe a young child how to be a farmer. Uh, we teach them, but at some point we've got to let go of their hand, and we've got to let them do it on their own. Uh, and, and I'm just looking out there. There's three generations of farmers uh, just, well, everywhere. <laughs> when you're at a country church, everybody's a farmer, I guess. <clears throat> but we teach our children so that they'll know. And then we let go and let them be independent. And sometimes that's what God is doing in our life. God is letting us become mature in our faith. You see, God saves us, but and then he teaches us, but he wants us to, to do our part. God will do his part in our salvation, but he wants us to do our part in our relationship with him. He doesn't call us to sit back and do nothing. He calls us to mature in our faith. We are the ones that must, must look at his word. We must learn and grow in his scriptures and in our faith. And we must trust that his way is the better way. We need to be dependent on God, but we also need to be independent in what we do for God. That doesn't mean that God is not with us. When you let go of your child's hand when he's riding a bike or when he's learning to farm or, or whatever, uh, you're probably like me. You're standing right there watching them the whole way, and you're ready to catch them if they fall. God is definitely working with us to help us in our life. Uh, and when King Ahasuerus, when he gave the, when he told them to come up with a solution, uh, the solution that they come up with, it, it kind of seems like a no-brainer. You know, the, the decree was issued that everybody could kill the Jews on one day. So the resolution for that was, uh, stand up and defend yourself. Kind of makes sense, Right. Just like what Abraham Lincoln did uh, with his proclamation. He gave black men the right to stand up and to, to defend themselves. To fight for what was right. And I think every one of us in here can, can agree today that slavery is wrong. Slavery is wrong. The degrading of another human being by one human is wrong. Uh, so I'm so thankful that we had a president that saw that and and try to fix that problem. 
You see, when evil resides in a people's heart, when evil resides in a world that is trying to destroy us, we have the right. We have the obligation to stand up and to defend our faith. There's a lot of evil that's going on around the world today that's going against Christians only. And we have to stand up. We have to take a stand and stand for what's right and not what's wrong. And hopefully we do that in love. And we don't do that in anger and hatred. Because the world's got enough anger and hatred in it. Countless times throughout our history as a nation, as a country, evil has tried to overtake humanity. But we have called on the men and women of this country to stand up and defend what was right. Does anybody know what Armistice Day is? Maybe we know it better as Veterans Day. The 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, there was a peace treaty that was signed in World War I. You see, we stood up against evil and we fought World War I to stop evil in its tracks. And we come to that resolution, we come to peace. How about D-Day? Everybody know what D-Day is? June 6, 1944. That was the day that we invaded uh, the beaches of Normandy to fight off evil, to help the French to secure their, their safety. How about DJ Day, Victory Over Japan Day, on 8, on August 15, 1945. That was the day that we finally came to peace with Japan from World War II. Maybe there's another day that we rose up that might really have more meaning to us today than all the other ones. It's the day that we rose up and we became a nation, July 4th, 19, uh, 1776, Independence Day. Millions of people are gonna go around the world and spend millions if not billions of dollars uh, or around our country and spend that much money to buy some fireworks to let off to celebrate and then to remember the day that we became free, that we were liberated from England. You see, we've all got things that we can celebrate. We can come together and we can celebrate Mother's Day and Father's Day. We can celebrate the 4th of July, Veterans Day, Memorial Day. We can do all of these things because God has given us a reason, a reason to celebrate. He's given us the freedom in this country to live for Him. And yet many in this country turn their back on God and they don't want to live for Him. They want to live for Satan. They want to live their way uh, and not God's way. But you see in our story today, when you look at the Jews, they had reason to celebrate. They finally had a reason to celebrate. They were able to defend themselves, and for once they finally had hope. Hope. I don't want you to miss this. They had hope. And that hope led many people to becoming Jews themselves. You see, when we hold on to hope, it changes the way the world sees us. When we go outside of these doors and we're living with hope, the world will notice it. If we go outside of these doors like Esther and Mordecai were before they were allowed to make that, uh, that edict uh, where they could stand up and fight for themselves, they were defeated. But the king gave them a reason to hope. Jesus gives us a reason in our world today to go out and hope. And the world is waiting to see if we have hope. Do we trust God? Do we trust him for what he says? Or do we trust ourselves? You see, hope can open up the doors to somebody's salvation. If we have hope in our hearts, then maybe it'll lead them to the Lord. Our world seems pretty bleak right now. Everybody hates everybody. 
everybody seems to be at war all over the world. Almost every day you can look at something and, and we're on the verge of a war somewhere. But I have a hope. I have a hope that one day God's going to call us home. We're all going to go up to heaven. There's going to be no more war, no more hatred, no more sickness, no more death, no more destruction. And that hope is what drives me. And I hope and I pray that hope is what drives you. The hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Because I can tell you, nobody is going to come to the Lord if they don't see hope living in us. Nobody will. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, there are times in our lives where we feel defeated. God, only you can give us the hope that'll help us to endure anything in this world. God, I know that we have reason to celebrate. And that reason is Jesus. God, I thank you for sending your son to pay the price for my debt, for all of our debt. Help us to cling to the feet of Jesus till we make it back to your kingdom. And Father, may that lure others into following Jesus because of the hope that they see in us. Forgive us, Father, on those times when we don't seem to have much hope, when heartache seems to rule our day. Forgive us and help us to shine brighter than ever that people might see you. Father, we love you and we praise you. We give this time to you in Jesus' name.